Um, this is the climate change panel and welcome to all those people online um, and we've got a fairly full agenda we've got some interesting stuff ahead of us um, so I will just belt on with stuff um, and we'll just go through the beginning of the agenda um, apologies we don't have any apologies no I haven't received any okay that's let me tick that off. Um, declarations for everyone. I think all the councillors know what they are. I won't go through them, otherwise they will go to sleep. Um, and so I'm sure we haven't got any, but if you have any, please speak now. And I hear silence, that's fine. Um, so the minutes are the next item, um, and I wondered if anyone, I won't go through all the pages, but thank you for doing the minutes. They're brilliant, actually, of what we did last time. Um, <coughs> has anyone please got anything to say or add to the previous minutes? Um, Councillor Hayes. Hayes. Just uh, going through it, and I know that you're aware of this one, was Neil Matthews' very good walking and cycling strategy. Just to bring you up to date, I actually, uh, the Wingfield Parish Council had this, and they complemented the work that's going through the council with regards to this as well. Well, unfortunately, uh, last week they met uh, with um, the Crown Estate. I said I will join them the next meeting they're having, just to see whether we could get the Crown Estate involved with cycling, and unfortunately, they're not up this, at this moment, okay? Worked, but it is something that hopefully in the future can be looked at. Well, thanks for that. I know that you've done all the work on that. Yes. and. Um, it's a shame that they don't want to play. It's not that they don't want to play. They're at this point in time, they're waiting. Okay, so well, we keep trying, yep. I think's the answer. Okay, anybody else got any... Um, Mary? <laughs> I move acceptance of the minutes. Excellent. Anybody else like to second that? Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, okay, moving on. Urgent matters. I don't think we have any. I get shaking in the room. So that's no. Um, Kevin, um, a very good evening to you. Um, where are you, Kevin? Somewhere in London? Chair, I was in Bracknell earlier. Oh, um, no, I just... <laughs> I just I did checking. skip past the leader just to, uh, to make sure I caught my train. Um, I understand. But yes. The wonders of southeast transport is brilliant. <laughs> um, OK, um, Kevin, if you could just update us. I know there's quite a lot in this, actually, isn't there? Um, I don't know if you wanted questions at the end or whether we could just interrupt you. I was just going to run through um, and then perhaps we could take questions and quarter three. Okay. I do have um, Alex Bennett's um, uh, part of our update, um, but I think he's going to be coming as a separate item. So actually more the exciting stuff's in Alex's uh, presentation than mine. But I'll just take you through this rather quickly and then, as I said, hopefully um, a lot of this stuff members would be aware of, but... Um, it's, it's always worth in terms of just bringing members up to date in terms of our quarter three performance against the climate change um, strategy. And just to remind members in terms of um, the, the number of projects that we are working on and intend to continue to work on. Um, so we've got 46 live projects at this point in time. Um, 13 have been completed since we've uh, um, started on this this action plan um, th there's a range of, of sizes to those projects and um, the internal governance on those projects is through uh, Damien James who you have in the room and obviously I advise the panel uh, and report to CMT and the executive in terms of performance across the whole piece. So my update is really an update on behalf of the um, key uh, teams within the organisation um, so uh, a place planning regeneration through the parks and countryside team for quarter three have reported an increase in the borough's tree coverage. A total of 1,300 new trees have been planted across the borough in quarter three. This includes uh, projects such as hedgerow development and woodland regeneration. Members will remember that we are looking at the species of tree as part of our biodiversity as much as the coverage of trees. 
Uh, wildlife sites, a recent report found that Bracknell Forest has had an increase of 17.7 hectares of designated local wildfire sites since 2020. And uh, the, the team report that collaboration between volunteers and the rangers um, have uh, been working on maintaining and caring for the orchard in Lark Hill. Uh, and the pictures in the, the, the uh, presentation are from their work in December. Uh, within the Resources Directorate, our um, joint, um, a, a joint property um, initiative, which is the Cambrian Partnership, um, has created, or in the process of creating uh, on Coopers Hill, 52 environmentally friendly town centre homes. Um, the features for these uh, properties include solar panels on the roofs, electric vehicle charging points, AAA appliances in the homes, plus 122 cycling bays, sustainable drainage and new paths and cycleways. Um, I'm on the board of the Cambrian Partnership and our partners, which is Countryside Development, have a very strong environmental and sustainability agenda. And I know they've done a private presentation to members, but um, a key partner in terms of bringing forward not only um, new houses, but sustainable houses based on our own climate change objectives. We're in place planning and regeneration, the highways and transport team. Um, they have brought forward the My Journey app on our website, which will uh, make journey planning easier, um, uh, sustainable, and encouraging people to walk and cycle as well. So uh, a, a massive improvement in using technology to enable people to make better transport choices. The programme of rolling out of the EV charging points continues. Um, 32 points, I think we've been talking about these for some time. The programme started in quarter three, I think we're um, well finished now, but in terms of just reporting on quarter three, we can see that those sites have been increasing over the period. I thought it was useful for Kevin, members. Can just I just, sorry, can I just interrupt one thing? Um, would it be possible, please, to have a report once these are opened on the usage of them to the committee? Obviously, it won't be this one because we may not be here, but the next one, anyway. And, 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 uh, I think my, my next little insert, uh, Chair, was just really to give a sense of the UK population. So, yes, I think we can bring back our own usage. Um, but I think the key thing is, in terms of EV charging points is, one, to make sure that people feel that... Um, if they don't have charging at home, that there is opportunity to charge on uh, outside of the home. But as we know, that all new properties which are now being built are being built with EV charging points. And that really takes the pressure off um, a model where you fill your car up at designated um, petrol stations to actually the vast majority of people charging at home and being able to sustain that without actually having those public charging points. But just uh, an insight into this slide, just to show the growth of um, charging points and different charging points since 2016 to February this year, we can see that there's been a, a massive um, increase in those charging opportunities across the UK. Within the delivery directorate, with my directorate, the Public Protection Partnership set out to do um, two things around air quality. We do have two air quality monitoring areas within the borough area, but we uh, received specific grants with our colleagues in West Barks to attack PM 2.5 um, uh, emissions uh, and monitoring at schools. And we, in our interim report, 28 schools show compliance with the uh, PM 2.5 particulars, uh, particulates, uh, the limit set out in DEFRA's air quality objectives. And we've also completed the program of training our civil enforcement officers to uh, tackle and to, and to idling. And we know that we've uh, our own local school um, uh, designed the, um, the, the, the posters and livery that we're using to promote anti-idling around school areas. Um, again, within my directorate and uh, close to Damien's heart across the road, across the table, maybe not as um, uh, passionate as 
uh, Councillor Hayes is across the table in terms of our waste management, um, our recycling day um, of 2022, uh, over three tonnes of electrical items and clothing were collected in October in our recycling day, the second one of 2022. Um, our premium uh, uh, scheme in terms of uh, allowing everyone to participate in rolling out of environmentally friendly and uh, sustainable living, which is our food waste recycling program. We can see that that's uh, continued to be a success over the, the year. Um, we are uh, perhaps one of the most successful food waste uh, rollouts in the country. Um, we're seeing that we're still collecting uh, 2.44 kilograms of waste per household and we've diverted 2,700 tonnes of food waste from landfill this financial year. And just expanding the scheme in terms of the council itself actually participating, we have introduced uh, um, food waste recycling and, and uh, 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 waste recycling within the Times Square, our corporate headquarters. Um, and so we're making sure that uh, not only we as a, uh, an employer, are encouraging the recycling and recycling of food, but also doing that for the community itself. The members will uh, remember a couple of meetings ago now that we looked at um, the cost of living crisis and specifically around environmental steps that people can take, which not only will save money, but also protect the environment. So that was your October meeting that we shared some advice and support for residents and um, that information was passed out into the community. We know that the community hubs um, open for residents during November um, and using our libraries as part of that community hub programme also encourages people to um, come together in community, which we also know is good for the mental health of the community. And a sustainable wall programme directly targeting energy efficiency for eligible households and retrofitting work is due to begin in quarter four. Uh, warm and safe well, public health funded enables in, uh, energy improvements to a, 13, a further 13 vulnerable residents has also taken place. Within the Chief Exec Directorate, um, a, a number of um, comms messages and I, I recognise that members have said in the past that we really need to get the message out into the community. Um, uh, our work is nothing if actually the community don't um, have a sense of what we're doing but also that we can use the council's strength of communication to really market those changes that people can make and the things that we're doing. So we participated in a number of different initiatives. So the Global Action in Schools Day, was used to celebrate as an opportunity to celebrate our climate change work. Um, we know that we have funded um, through our executive member for children's services um, a, a number of our uh, secondary schools to bring forward their own programmes and we hope to in future meetings bring forward the sort of first step or first uh, reports from those projects at each of those schools. We also participated in the running out of time relay, which was a relay baton relay between uh, COP26 and COP27. Um, uh, again, um, uh, Damien and Gareth Jones, our head of climate change and sustainable living, um, we had them beating the streets, but I know that Dot was out there and uh, the mayor was out there as well. So really making sure that um, people could see that Bracknell Forest was engaged in those efforts. We're also keen to make sure that we're engaging with the wider community. It was one of the things that we'd not quite got to on our action plan. And so um, uh, I think members had a presentation from um, our graduate trainee, Seb Wright, um, and Seb's been really working with the business community in terms of engaging with the business community. And I know um, uh, Gareth Jones, uh, uh, Climate Change and Sustainable Living Officer, did a presentation to the BID as part of their um, sort of breakfast meetings. And so we're really seeing that sort of engagement with the business community and asking them to come on board. And we're helping them to set up a group which will be self-sustaining in terms of how businesses in the borough can also contribute and make sure that they're um, uh, doing what they can to make sure that we're 
all pulling in the same direction. We've updated our website and so the, the schools page and the business page and the community pages have become clearer so that information is more accessible and more targeted to those communities. And we've also launched uh, an email learning module for our own staff so that we're able to add that in as part of the corporate training for, for staff. But you can see that actually across um, a, a number of different ways that we've been trying to get the message out. But we also, as I said, been inserting our messages into the normal corporate communications and onto our website. And by developing um, easy to see attractive graphics, I think what we're able to do is to also engage people in this conversation rather than just pe people seeing it as something that they can just um, turn the page on and not necessarily engage with. We, we're also recognising that there's a number of um, external bodies who are looking to see what the council's doing and also benchmark what the council's doing. I think we've been um, quite concerned in the past that those groups have simply looked at very old data or not gone to data sources which we would consider to be reputable. Um, we've engaged with uh, Climate Emergency UK and uh, rather than just allow them to um, uh, not necessarily get the information we think is the most up to date and most reliable, we've actively made sure that we've looked through what those measures will be this year and uh, along with the FOIs that they put through, we've gathered that data together and we've put that onto our website as sort of a data dump that will enable both this group and other community groups to be able to interrogate where we actually are on our journey, where we um, would welcome their help and support to point out where we're not doing things, but also to celebrate the things that we have done. Um, a lot of effort goes into some of the work that we do and it's really important that um, we as an organisation celebrate that. We recognise that people are really concerned to know what the council's doing. We need to make sure we get that message out there. But equally, by getting our data out into the community, hopefully people are able to point out what are the things that we need to be doing next or where do we need to double our efforts. And uh, as I said, the, the, the comms team have, um, over the period, 16 climate uh, um, change related stories were issued between October and December. Um, launched a weekly tip campaign um, on social media to help residents reduce their carbon footprint and ran a sustainable Christmas campaign with daily tips on how to make Christmas much more sustainable. And I think, Chair, at that point, I'm happy to take questions. OK, thank you very much, Kelly. Um, could I just start? I know there's a couple here, but... Um, I think you mentioned in the report about the EVs, Kevin, um, and it was dependent on the local plan, but actually um, there's already planning um, regulations already in force. So people in new houses have to have an EV point um, as standard, don't they? Yeah, so, so, it, so the, the, uh, these are building control regulations, but the regulations yeah. changed, and I think... Uh, uh, Councillor Turrell did put a note round to members to say that yes, new, new new homes now must have uh, EV charging points, and um, new standards are coming soon to new buildings, um, which will also mean that the emissions from those buildings will also need to be within standards. So what we're seeing really is that the building industry has now joined the fight, um, and obviously all those new buildings which come online will be to that newer, higher standard. The real issue, I think, is about retrofitting buildings and going back and seeing how we can support people in that retrofitting work. And I know that, uh, again, um, last meeting, uh, I think Councillor Leek was asking some questions about our own scheme in terms of looking after or looking to see what are the worst performing buildings and how do we bring those up using government grant monies. Yeah, indeed. Um, could I then also ask, um, when we had a report last about local businesses, it wasn't exactly brilliant as far as climate change um, uh, initiatives. I just wondered, you know, I know it's great to see that we've got um, some offices on this and um, they will assist businesses. I just wondered how you think, Kevin, we can assist. Obviously, the, the greatest thing will be money, I suppose, in putting 
um, things in the equipment, use this, do that, whatever, to mm -hmm. cut carbon down. But I just wondered what your thoughts were and what, you know, if we can have some feedback on that, because I think that's one area that perhaps needs some, some uh, assistance. I, I, I think our, it, in, in all of these different spaces, our main role is about coordinating the action of the community itself to be able to drive some of these elements forward. So the thing that we can do is to bring people together under a common banner and to create the space to um, for those self-sustaining communities to be brought forward. In effect, we have very little money, but what we can do is we can get an officer to pull together a group of businesses, have the conversation, see whether they want to come together as a sort of a, a community working group, and then for them to um, take that message out to the, the other businesses. So that's what Seb's been doing. He's been sitting down and trying to get the coalition of the willing together. I think we do have a group who are um, willing to um, start that group, and we will participate. We will come along. We will give our uh, our, our views and, and and like any other business but what we won't be doing is actually uh, grant funding that group uh, what we would hope is that that group will be able to within their own organizations through the sort of corporate social responsibility bring funding together but what we're really looking for them to do is to see that investing in uh, energy energy efficiency is good for them and good for the environment so I think um, as our chief executive, Susan Halliwell, would say, if you look at the acreages of roof that most businesses have, um, putting EV, um, uh, 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 PV cells over that roof thing uh, would be really great for that business in terms of reducing and sustaining their energy costs. But it'd be really good to take them off the grid in terms of um, a sustainable way of living. So that's what our role is. It's about bringing and coordinating rather than grant funding and using their own very, very small financial resources. I wondered also, Kevin, um, if we had an open day, I think um, it must have been about six months ago or something, that Hazel and some officers were uh, involved in, people could come in. and I wonder if we should do that again at some point later in the year or something. Um, so that we Chair, could... Chair we, do, we, got, we, we do have a, um, a business conference um, uh, in the planning um, Perfect. I didn't I think know that. It, 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 will, it will come, I think, just after the election period. Okay. But again, what we're looking for is for that those businesses to orchestrate that that um, conference. And we already know that uh, uh, a couple of venues have been put forward by the the, the sector themselves. Um, they're looking to source speakers, and they want to make it more of a less more of a, a workshop than a showcase. But we're there making sure that we can, the thing I said we can do is stick our branding on that so that people see it's something important to turn up to. Yeah, great. Lovely, thanks. Um, before I hand this to Damien, because he wants a quick word, and then we'll go to the floor for questions. Um, Hannah, I forgot to tell you, uh, Tina gave her apologies, and it's just come to my mind, apologies. Damien. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to supplement uh, Kevin's answer, if I may. Uh, just a couple of things uh, that I know are happening uh, as we speak. So um, there is a uh, Bratton Forest Business Climate Action Working Group which has been set up um, and they've had, uh, uh, they're coming up to their second meeting now uh, in a couple of weeks time actually. Uh, that's been chaired by Councillor Wade um, as uh, in his role as uh, sort of business champion. Um, so that's uh, started uh, and they're working through uh, sort of various actions to look at what they can do uh, and how we uh, can support and signpost businesses. Uh, our web pages have been updated in relation to businesses in Bratton Forest as well, so there's information uh, on our website which uh, uh, they can look at. Uh, as Kevin has mentioned, there's a conference uh, which we're working on as well. Um, and uh, as Kevin mentioned in the presentation, Gareth Jones presented at the local bid um, breakfast forum on climate change uh, a week or so ago. Um, and uh, we are also engaged in uh, sort of annual surveys with businesses. So this is where the information we got last year came back, which you referred to. So we're just waiting for the final results on this year's survey to see, uh, and we'll be able to see if there's any been any improvement in that period. So. Smashing. <coughs> it's really good um, to hear all that because um, uh, local businesses are a big a quarter of this, aren't they? A good proportion of this. So um, any help to them would be, would be great. Um, Councillor Hayden, did you want to say something? Thanks, Chair. Um, 
Kevin, could you confirm that um, any construction projects of our own within the borough, um, you know, i.e. in Camo's team, for instance, it's part of the standing, standing procedures now to investigate things like uh, uh, solar panels. It's almost a standing item now. Uh, yes, Chair. W one of the things, obviously, um, once we implemented our climate change strategy, um, part of that strategy is the fact of, through every part of the Council's activity, that um, the climate and net zero is taken into account. So as a builder, um, and, and you'll be hearing from Alex Bennett um, shortly, um, even when we're looking at a maintenance um, to a building, we're looking to see what we can do in terms of reducing its carbon impact, looking to see how we in, in improve the thermal efficiency of the building. And so what we're looking for is to sort of um, make whatever purchasing decisions we were going to make to have this as an element as part of that discussion so that we can make sure that we don't end up with sort of two tracks of work, one track of work um, doing climate change mitigation and another track of work building new buildings or um, repairing buildings. They are one in the same now. And I think we've seen that with the new depot, which is uh, very sustainable. Um, and we've seen that in terms of just the basic works that we've been doing to say Bracknell Leisure Centre, where we'll be increasing the uh, amount of PV cells onto the roof there, just as part of the roof replacement program. So in effect, it's actually part of our standing orders now, isn't it? Yes, Chair, absolutely. Okay, that's great. Um, can I pass also to um, Councillor Ingham, uh, Sandra? Hey, thank you, Chair. And thank you, Kevin. Um, okay, so the Climate Change Scorecard 2022, we only got one out of nine for community engagement and communication. So hopefully 2023, we'll see quite a big uplift in that. Um, I just want to compliment you on the presentation. It was light on text and it was beautifully illustrated. So my question to you, Kevin, is will you allow me to have a link, well, for councillors to have a link, so they can share it on social media? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think the, the, the first one is about the, the scorecard. I think the reason we've taken the scorecard so seriously this year is because uh, we weren't asked last year. So we saw the number and thought that don't look right. Um, so yes, if the presentation is useful, we'll make sure that that's available to members so that you can uh, get that out on social media. It's really important that as members that you can make sure you're championing this and, and the work that we're doing um, because that's part of our engagement with the, with the community at large. Okay, that's great. Super. So uh, will that come by email or um, on the chat, Kevin? I, 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 I can say Hannah's got her hand yeah, up. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> happy to lot. circulate it after the meeting. I'll do it by email. Oh, super. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Sandra, very much. Uh, Councillor Templeton. Yeah, can you tell me what is meant by sustainable drainage, please? <laughs> Chair, no. <laughs> Good um, luck on this one, Kevin. I, 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 I was going to say, I, 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 can, I can go, actually, Alex is on. There's no point <laughs> having a surveyor on tap and not being able to ask him <laughs> a question. But uh, Alex, did you, as, as the, the resident builder in the family? Um, I, I don't have a definition of, of sustainable drainage to hand, unfortunately. <laughs> So, was Chair, unfortunately, no. If, if, if <laughs> what we will do uh, for, for Councillor Templeton is we will get the details from the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, Somewhat. yeah, from the JV team <laughs> and ask him to uh, pass that, that detail along. Thank you, because my mind is going through what could possibly be drainage and in sustain, and yeah, and I'd like a definition because it um, could be less complicated than all of coming out as drinking water at the end of it. So my, my second question is, can I have a second question? Yes, of Everton? course. Um, my second question is, is there anybody going out to see what is happening at the school gates and to reinforce the non-idling? Perhaps uh, Damien could pick that up. Uh, may I? Yeah, thank you. Um, 
Uh, yes, there is. Uh, so our um, parking enforcement officers, uh, our contractors, NSL, who patrol around the borough um, as part of their work, they have now been trained by the Public Protection Partnership uh, in, in enforcing. Um, I say enforcing because actually the first step, as I think we've talked about before, is education and having discussions with drivers who um, might not realise um, that they're, they're idling outside school gates. But um, yes, they have been doing that quite successfully. They've had some leaflets produced for them which they um, can give to drivers as well. Um, and it's about that conversation really, first of all, um, to, to make sure that uh, parents are aware of what they might be doing. Um, I think enforcement would be, would be a last resort option, but it is there if, if we need to go down that route. Thank you. Presumably, Damien, you know, if people are constantly um, there and constantly breaking this, then enforcement is the only way. But councillors can also help in, in this matter because, you know, it's up to councillors to have a good look at their area. And if they see some people behaving badly, um, then it should be reported to the correct officer. I think that goes without saying. Um, could, Kevin, could... Yes, I'm sorry. Lots of people putting their hand up something. Um, I'll Councillor Hayes. Yeah, I'll yes. carry on from there. At the, the Mary, I was actually outside Ascot Heath School last week, and the parents there, the ones that do walk to school and are on the PTA, it is us that gets the message out as well, and I'm finding that a lot of parents are coming on board more so and are assisting us with that as well, which is showing that we it's, it's not us wanting officers, it's us as well getting the message out there. And it, uh, um, as I said, I was uh, actually outside the school with mothers going okay. up and asking people to turn off their cars. Councillor Hayden. Thanks, Chair. It's with reference to Mary, Mary's question about sustainable drainage. I Googled it, um, oh, and it's a, it, there's lots there, <laughs> uh, including uh, definitions coming from the LGA as well. Uh, but essentially, designed to manage, oh, it's known as SUDS, S, little U, capital D. Yes. Yeah. We, we have yeah. someone doing some, don't we, uh, Kevin? In the council? In highways. Yeah. In highways. Yeah. We have an officer on no. subs, actually. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sure we do. Uh, Chair, Councillor Mossum has actually put a, 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 a note in the chat in terms of sustainable drainage systems. So I know Councillor Mossum is uh, uh, more qualified than I am in this, so maybe. Councillor um, Mossum, would you, like, would you like to enlighten us? No, I just asked Mr. Google. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it, from what I said on chat, it also can be used uh, to prevent water pollution and flooding in urban areas. Yeah. Also creating green spaces and habitat for wildlife in town and cities. And that a le legal requirement in Scotland. Mary is uh, looking at me. I'm wondering how <laughs> we're going to get all that in Cooper's Hill. However... Uh, Councillor Hayden, before I was interrupted, um, this is a, it's de uh, designed to manage stormwater locally, as close to its source as possible, to mimic natural drainage, and encourage its infiltration, attenuation, and passive treatment. Yeah, and there is some information on the website. And there is an officer in charge of this. I know there is, because I've dealt with uh, this person before. Um, Kevin, could I just ask you one other thing? The community winter hubs, were they successful? And will they continue? Where are we with that, please? Chair, yeah, I, I, I can say off the top of my head, but I haven't got a briefing on that. So rather than... Rather than make something up and then have um, colleagues in uh, the chief exec's office pulling their hair out in horror, saying uh, you got your information wrong, I prefer to reserve and then perhaps get uh, Abby Thomas, who's the AD responsible for that area, to come back to the chair. I think that would be useful. Councillor Templeton would like to say. Well, I run the Winter Hub at Great Holland's Community Centre from two till four every Friday, and we get regularly about 24 people come and as you say it beats isolation we play silly games and we all have a lot of fun and laughter cake and tea and coffee and they just say it's got to go on forever because this isn't a winter hub we just want to be here forever so it's really really successful and lots of people come 
and they come from Birchill and Hamworth, and we've got a lady from Priest with them, one came from Warfield last week, because she'd heard it was really good, so there you go. It's, ours is lovely. Can I just ask, is that going to continue, or will that just be for the winter? Yeah, this is the, as the director responsible for libraries, um, I think we've always said in the library network that we consider those always to be hubs and community hubs and uh, a, a, a space where people can come together. So we know we're going to do something around the coronation to ensure that people have a space to come together and to celebrate that. So I've, I think as a, as a concept, it was really around um, sustainable living. But actually, the real thing is about how people can come out in communities and yeah, uh, yeah. find friendship. And we know that just adults finding friendship is much more difficult than when we were at school. Yeah. So if we can create spaces for social connection, that's absolutely um, the best thing for um, uh, uh, communities at large. Um, it'd be interesting to see what the impact is on, on in terms of carbon, because I think actually people coming together means that they aren't um, boiling kettles at mm. home mm. and uh, doing everything mm. as a, an individual, but also as, as, a, as, a, as a group. And that surely must be better for everyone. I think that, I know there's people on the speak, I think that would, I would, I think as a committee, we'd very much recommend that somehow we, we, we try and continue that because it, it, it does help people get together. And it's surprising, uh, Kevin, when you go somewhere else, you, as you say, you don't use your own resources. Uh, which saves them money as well in very difficult times. So uh, I think that's a very good uh, good thing. Um, uh, Councillor Hayes, did you want, and then Councillor Templeton? Yes, carrying on from uh, Councillor Templeton's. Um, on a Wednesday, once a month, Tesco's actually help by doing teas and that for people at the community centre in Martin's Heron, which I attend. It's older persons at the moment, but they've come forward now asking in the future via the parishes, and this is where we could get the parishes and towns on board, um, could there, the hub be extended for not just once a month, of which they were doing there? Because you, some of the libraries aren't of a good size. The, it might be the community centres we could be looking at. Yeah. Absolutely agree. Yeah. And, and, and I think we need more, you know, we, we can do more on that to encourage cooperation. Um, Mary. I just think the well-being section of it is the important for that is just so very, very essential. And one of the gentlemen that comes every Friday, he tells me it's the fastest two hours of the week. And that says a lot, really. I mean, it's a sad statement, but it, that's what he says. And so, and we won't stop it. We'll just go on. Okay. So. Brilliant. Okay. Um, Councillor Mottam, did you want to say something? No, it's an old hand, sorry. No worries. Um, could I just ask one other question before we move on, uh, Kevin? And it's going back to the emissions. Um, and I know that I remember seeing a report, and I know we're doing work on it, but uh, particularly in Crowthorn High Street, which was the highest, I think, with another area, which was by the fire station, if I remember rightly. But anyway, uh, going back to the Crowthorn High Street, I just wondered if you had any reports on that. And could we have some feedback on those emissions to the committee, please? The chair, there was two um, uh, monitoring areas. One was Crowfall High Street and one was um, uh, the, where we've just done the road improvements, actually, on, on um, where the road. Uh, Damien is... <laughs> I'm he's it, itching to so say something. Yeah. He, he's, he's just a director for that, so he'll have the, the sort of the latest information. Worth saying that obviously the uh, the reports for that go to the Joint Public Protection Committee. So if members wanted to look back and see where that monitoring goes forward and is monitored, it'll be that joint committee. But Damien has got the details. Damien. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, absolutely right. So two air quality monitoring areas within Bracknell Forest. Uh, one Crowthorn High Street, the second one is Downshire Way. Um, those are areas where we have additional monitoring in place and we produce a, an annual report for DEFRA for both those areas. Um, as Kevin has rightly said, those are put through the Joint Public Protection Committee as part of their remit uh, when they discuss air quality. And um, those reports are available online for anybody to have a look at uh, their public reports 
So we submit them to DEFRA, they get reviewed by DEFRA and they uh, then put their own comments on it and return it to us. Um, it can sometimes take quite a long time, so the reports are um, about a year behind um, because uh, we can't publish them until DEFRA has made their comments on them. But uh, yeah, they're available in the public domain. But Damien, just to follow up on that, because air quality is obviously one of the biggest things in, in climate change, I guess. Um, I know the reports, and there's obviously analysis of the quality of the air, but where does that go from then? If DEFRA say this is above average and unacceptable, what, what's the plan? Well, the reports don't say that, so I think that's the, the first thing, is actually they say that the air quality uh, management areas are well managed, uh, they're within the tolerances that they would expect to see, um, and they have seen improvements in those areas, for a particular example, you know, down Shaway, uh, and the duelling that we have uh, has reduced the congestion within that area and therefore the traffic becomes more free flowing and, uh, and the emissions reduce as a result of that. So um, th they make quite specific comments uh, around that. I think the last report um, it does make more interesting reading because it's, uh, as a, it's taken a snapshot of um, uh, the COVID time. So uh, there was a drop in traffic in that. Uh, particular time anyway, but uh, as I say, the reports are there for anybody to read and comment on. Thanks. I think we should. Um, I think members should have a look at that, particularly the members for that area in the borough, uh, and just review them and, and see if they want to ask any questions or raise any points. So, um, but anyway, it's great, great that the work is being done. So, thank you very much for that. Um, I don't know if anybody else would like any other questions to ask of um, of Mr. Gibbs before we pass on Mary. Can I just ask on um, refits and everything, because I know Warfield Park, um, Park Homes have had help and support, but I know there's other park homes around the borough. Uh, do we generally help all park homes, or does it depend on the owner? Or Because park homes, some of them have just got on to me to say that they're, be, he'll, I know they've now got their 400 pound, but they are, their heating bills are astronomical because they're old and not very well looked after. Chair, I'll start and then perhaps Damien can, can um, step in. Obviously, um, what, we, what we do across the whole of the um, borough is we look at the energy efficiency certificates. Um, and we've had a, a sort of a rolling program using government money to be able to raise up the worst performing properties. I know that a, a, um, a sustainability officer, Hazel Hill, has been working with different um, park homes to be able to see what we can do in terms of helping with their efficiency, both in terms of um, what we can clad onto the, the, the buildings, but also what we can do in terms of sustainable heat sources. So uh, at Warfield Park, it was around um, bringing in mains gas. So, um, but obviously it's about distributing government grant money rather than government, uh, about the, the council investing its own funds in this. So it really depends on what the detail of the, the schemes which are available. But I don't know if Damien's got anything more he can add. Um, th there's some detail on our website again, um, which points the, the way in terms of the um, various grants that are available um, to various types of housing. Um, there are contact details on there as well um, if someone wants uh, more information. But um, yeah, it, it does depend on what grants are available. Um, we try and bid for whatever we can. Uh, we have been more successful bidding as, as a collective southeast uh, enterprise rather than uh, an individual uh, local authority. And uh, that's where we've seen our success recently. But um, yeah, uh, there are, there are where there are opportunities, we will try and grab some money from the government. Yeah. On um, Councillor Virgin and I, Councillor Townsend, did visit Warfield. It's the management were working with that as well, and it it, it was quite um, interesting to see that 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 the ownership and management were working with the residents up there. It might be worth even even talking to Warfield. Oh, up I know there. Warfield yeah. Done no, but this was a complete this was a complete idea of theirs. It wasn't just them thinking alone. No, I mean they they um, I mean it's quite well run site that yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And um, 
they they inspired uh, EVs of their own, didn't they, and so on and so on. Um, and actually, travelling around, it's interesting. I went to Kent a long time ago, um, and even there was a hotel I stopped at to have refreshment, and they had four EVs that the hotel itself had paid for and put in. Quite extraordinary. So, you know, it's something else that public houses here could, could maybe look at that, or maybe we could encourage them. One thing I... Kevin, I know we can't do much about this, but it is surprising. Um, I know London, um, uh, the mayor is kind of... Uh, trying to, is it the city, I think, trying to reduce all the lighting um, within London. Uh, obviously, you know, not important lighting, but lighting that really is just there for, uh, you know, for show. Um, and I've often wondered, I mean, I went through the town centre, actually, and one or two shops have their doors open, which is still surprising with the heat going out. Um, I know there's not much we can do with our private shops, but, you know, it does, does, does amaze me. Um, and, and the other thing about offices generally, but I think if you have a kind of business forum, those kind of points could be brought up um, gently to say that you could save money here, chaps. Chair, I think that's the important thing, isn't it? That actually, um, uh, from a retailer's perspective, uh, a welcoming, inviting um, premise is normally well lit, um, warm, sometimes it's got music, uh, and all of these are using energy. Um, uh, we, we, through our town centre work, obviously are we encouraging people to be much more sustainable when they're working? And um, we've been successful in working with the lexicon to think about the lighting for the Avenue car park. Um, because although it's a new car park, it hasn't got all of the environmental um, uh, uh, lighting arrangements that we would like to see. And I know that uh, Damien and Kame Tor, the Assistant Director for Property, have been working with them. And hopefully in one of your future meetings, we'll bring forward another success story where we've been able to bring forward an idea which will um, not only keep that open inviting Bracknell's open for business look, but doing it in a much more sustainable way so that we're making sure that we're making best use of the limited resources that we've got as a planet. Yeah, again, it's all working together, isn't it? That's that's the secret to all this. Um, yeah. OK, um, look, I'm going to move on to the next item, um, which, uh, just to tell everyone, we were going to have Kame Tour doing this, but we'd like to welcome Alex Bennett. Um, so, Alex... Um, good evening to you, wherever you are. <laughs> Alex, how are you? Oh, good evening, Chair. Could you, Alex, could you just, because we don't know you very well, could you tell us what you do, first of all, if you wouldn't mind, and explain that to us, please? Yeah, yeah sure. So I'm a um, Charter Building Surveyor. Um, I um, sit in the property team working with uh, Kame Tor, Assistant Director of Property, and I head up the uh, construction and maintenance team Great. OK, thank you. Um, now, you're going to talk to us a, a, about this grant, aren't you, uh, I think, or part of it, which, am I right in saying was a, a million pounds that we managed to get? Is that right? Uh, yes, it was 785,000, but then topped up to a million from our planned maintenance project so that we could, as Kevin said, um, the, the Greeny Works and the planned maintenance projects um, run in tandem. Right. Well, uh, what, what, worth saying, Chair, because yep. Alex does sort of work for me as well. Hey! <laughs> um, Your team is getting it, bigger, Kevin. My, my team's getting smaller, Chair. That's why I'm running around like a headless chicken. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, the leader keeps me very busy. Um, the, the, the He's laughing pounds. at that point, I might add, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 or, or the, the projects that Alex is about to um, take the panel through was council money so this wasn't grant funded from elsewhere this was um uh, 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 i think we've we've just been having a conversation talking about as we've been looking at our planned maintenance program and looking forward in terms of how we maintain our estate um there was an opportunity to do an investor save so what we've been able mm. to do is to find a million pounds worth of council resources to put to this agenda um, and, and as Alex has just said, there's a little bit of topping up from one pot from another. But ostensibly, um, this is council money 
uh, being deployed on, on this work. Can, can I just say, I mean, I think that's absolutely brilliant, to be honest with you, because a lot of people criticise, oh, why on earth don't we get the savings from different departments and put it in a green area and try and, you know, upgrade some of our um, uh, facilities and stuff, which is exactly what you're doing. Um, but we need to really publicise that we're trying to do this, in my view. Um, but, Alex, I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Now, look, before you start here, am I right in saying that you but we haven't fixed all these items. So if we've got some, as a panel here, some really good ideas for consideration that we could put those forward. Is that right? Oh, before, before you drop him in that as well, <laughs> Chair, uh, I can see Councillor Hayden's got his hand up because uh, this, well, this work does come under Councillor Hayden and he, he is the uh, executive member sponsoring the work. Right. This, is a, this million pounds allocated so, but clearly what we will always do as part of our plan maintenance and uh, building works is we'll be looking to see if there are op other opportunities so that we can make a bid to achieve this, a similar type of, of work arrangement. We just need to make sure that we've got a workable program that we've got capacity to deliver. But uh, uh, I, I'm sure Councillor Hayden can add to it as it is his, his projects, really. We'll get to you in a minute, Alex. Don't worry. Councillor Hayden. <laughs> About midnight, Alex. <laughs> the um, the uh, CAME is uh, has responsibility for us for the one public estate, and she's proving and proven uh, absolute whiz at uh, finding grants that are available, uh, which just adds to our coffers and makes makes these projects easier to actually finance. So it's, it is a plug for CAME, but she's brilliant. It's actually finding out the OPE funding available and bringing it in. The uh, Avenue car park's a good example of that. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let Alex have his, have his say. Alex. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, members. Um, so, as you've probably gathered, um, I'm going to be providing a brief update from property on the greening projects, uh, plus the projects um, that are contributing uh, to the climate change strategy. So, um, we've already touched on it already, but firstly, to introduce myself, this is my first time presenting to the members. My name is Alex Bennett. I'm a chartered building surveyor, a member of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. and I've been in the construction industry uh, for in excess of 14 years. Um, I joined the council fairly recently in August last year um, after previously working in the private sector. Um, I've already mentioned this, but my, my role uh, within the council is I'm head of the construction and maintenance team within property, and I lead on both the school's planned maintenance program and the corporate plan maintenance program, as well as some of the other capital projects. Um, I work closely with Kame Tor, the assistant uh, director of property, um, to deliver the council's strategy for uh, maintaining their property portfolio. Oh, I'm getting some feedback. I don't know if that's... Yeah, could we just check all our mics are off so um, so we can stop the feedback, everybody? Okay, go ahead, uh, Alex. Okay, Belt carry on. on. Yeah. No worries. Um, so before I get into the greening projects, um, where does this fit into our uh, climate change strategy? So on screen is the, the climate change strategy uh, summarised to a page, and behind this it's an act action plan, and the greening projects address the, the element hi highlighted in red. Um, in that we are undertaking projects to reduce the CO2 under our control uh, by factoring this into our council building and maintenance projects. So in addition to this, these greening projects, um, the property team have been uh, carrying out other carbon reduction schemes. So we have the, um, the planned maintenance program, which consists of 24, uh, 24 projects of around 1.3 million pounds spend and the education plan maintenance program, which consists of 11 projects and around 1.5 million DFE funding allocation. Um, and within these projects, or these two programmes combined, uh, we'll be undertaking various works to reduce the carbon output. Um, and to give you some high level numbers, uh, we have uh, five projects involving the installation of solar panels, uh, three projects um, involving heating upgrades, and six projects where we're upgrading the insulation. And as mentioned earlier, these are now a matter of course. So we, when we do a roof replacement, we do automatically consider that roof for solar panels. Um, we've also been doing some work under the uh, public sector decarbonisation scheme. Uh, we have completed a heating 
um, replacement of Sandhurst School, reducing the carbon output of the school by 48 tonnes per year. Um, and that, and also uh, within the public sector decarbonisation decarbonisation scheme, we've also done a uh, fabric improvement um, across the school, which consists of uh, cavity wall insulation upgrades and insulation roof insulation upgrades. Um, and all of these projects that I've mentioned above um, are in addition to the greening projects, which I'm about to come on to in a second. So um, a little bit of background on the greening projects. Um, this is our first invest to save uh, project. Last year, the total spend on electricity was um, in the region of 1.2 million across the property portfolio. And in late September, the executive approved uh, an investor save bid of 785,000. Um, this, and this has been topped up to 1 million using our planned maintenance budget to carry out some of the essential repairs at the same time. Um, the, the purpose of the funding is to enable eight projects across seven sites, all with the aim of reducing the carbon output and therefore the council's energy costs. And it is predicted that these uh, schemes will reduce the carbon emissions by nearly 68 tonnes, uh, which would equate to over £103,000 per year at the current energy prices. So um, what are the, the, the eight projects? So we've got eight projects across seven sites. Um, so at Great Holland's Library, Community Centre and Children's Centre, uh, we're doing uh, cavity wall insulation, LED lighting upgrades and, syst and heating system improvements. At Larchwood Short Break Unit, uh, we're doing LED lighting upgrade and solar panels. Uh, Mallard House at Waterside Park, we're doing an, uh, a full roof replacement with an insulation upgrade uh, and solar panels. Ascot Heath Library, um, we're upgrading the LED lighting. Uh, we're looking to install solar panels at Birch Hill Library, um, upgrading the LED lighting at the uh, Bracknell Open Learning Centre and um, installing solar panels to East Hampstead and Wild Ridings Community Centre. Um, these projects are currently on, uh, currently being designed and they're scheduled for completion and on track for completion in October 2023. Um, I wanted to provide a little bit more detail about come a, a couple of the um, projects, um, just so that the uh, actual benefits of the work um, can can be identified. Um, at Great Holland's Library, Community Centre and Children's Centre, uh, we're upgrading the flat roof insulation to comply with current building regulations uh, and the loft insulation in the pitched roof. And roof and loft insulation can be the most cost effective way to reduce the heat loss in a property. Um, we're installing cavity wall insulation in the form of polystyrene beads, which is not the typical um, mineral uh, blown mineral fibre. That's uh, for a number of reasons. Um, a, it's it's more efficient. It improves the efficiency of a cavity wall by 77%, um, and also it's less prone to defects when uh, when it gets wet. Um, single glazed windows in the toilets uh, will be upgraded to double glazed units, uh, and these double glazed units are typically more than 80% more efficient. Um, not to mention the security and the safety benefits that also come with double glazed units compared to single glazed. Uh, we're installing LED lighting, um, and that will be in excess of 75%, uh, or we'll use less 75% less energy than the current lighting. And we're doing a review of the heating system uh, there to make sure that it runs as efficiently as possible. Um, Mallard House at Waterside Park. So this is a commercial unit that houses uh, the offices for EDS and Forest Care and also shares the building with a private car garage. Um, the roof is being replaced and upgraded to meet uh, the current building regulations. And the building has a large flat roof with no casting shadow, so it makes it ideal for solar panels. Oh. Um, and we're uh, estimating that once the project's complete, it will reduce the electricity cost by uh, around 60%. And then um, this is another project, the Avenue Car Park, which isn't part of the greening programme, but I just wanted to draw your attention to. Um, the property team have recently secured a grant funding of £600,000 from, uh, £600, from the uh, Capital Infrastructure Fund uh, to replace the existing lighting with LED units and to install PIR sensors. Um, the works are scheduled to be complete by the end of March 2024. Um, 
and we, so we leased this car park and we're five years into a 40 year lease um, and Bracknell Forest Council are responsible for paying 80% of the electricity costs, which currently equates to £26,000 a month. So the potential for savings from this project is, is really significant. Um, and it's estimated that it will reduce the carbon output by 24 tonnes per year just in this project alone. So uh, hopefully that's, uh, that provides you with a flavour of what we're doing in the property team, not, not just on the greening projects, but also across the, the plan maintenance uh, projects as well. So um, if anybody has any questions. Yes, I do. Um, Alex, thank you very much. Um, I'm shocked, actually. So I'm just shocked at the £26,000 per month of electricity. I think that's just extraordinary, to be honest with you. Um, it seems, excuse my vernacular, a hell of a lot of money to pay somebody. Um, I just, I, I don't know what to say about it, really. I don't know if other members have the same. Uh, just before okay, Damon speaks here, um, I don't know who our supplier is of, of power, uh, Alex, and I'm sure you'll, you'll tell us. Um, but I remember, I mean, for instance, the schools, uh, the schools that are in our domain, um, have their own power supply, don't they? They're not actually, they, we can't help them on that. They, 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 I suppose my question is, if we have a good company that would supply reasonably cheap energy, which this doesn't sound that cheap, um, could that not be invited to the schools on the same contract? They'd have to pay for it, I suppose, but at least they get a cheaper rate because it just seems a hell of a lot of money. Well, I think our, um, from what I gather, I mean, it's my colleague that deals with the um, electricity bills directly, but from what I gather, the, they've been frozen for the previous year and they're up for renewal um, in April. So I, I, I think that's in its in the previous year and, and it's likely to increase after April. Yeah, from what I I mean, it's, not, it's not fair to put you on the spot on this. Damien, um, give us some help here. Yeah, no, thank you, Chair. And I mean, it obviously is a, a big figure. We've been impacted significantly by the utility increase costs over the last 12 months. And to give you some indication, you know, they used to be circa, you know, 10 to 12,000 pounds a month, uh, as opposed to the 26 that Alex has now quoted. We have been supported, as you might be aware, by uh, government funding um, who have supported businesses over the, th the winter period this year. So that's not actually what we're paying, that's just the, the, the cost. Um, so we, we've seen some rebate come back from the government to support that cost. Um, but um, yeah, it, it, is, uh, it is a significant cost. I think it's worth pointing out that we have no control over who uh, supplies the electricity because it's not our building. Um, so we lease that building uh, on a 40-year lease, as Alex has said. Uh, the uh, supplier is tied into the uh, lexicon-owned part of the, the town centre, um, so we, we don't have any input into who that is. We are uh, looking uh, and have been looking at ways we can reduce our consumption of electricity in that site. And as Alex has rightly pointed out, the, the project is a really big step forward, a positive step forward for us in terms of uh, changing uh, technology in that car park to allow us to control those lights uh, more and better. I would point out that we want to make sure that the car park, which is uh, our flagship car park of the town centre, is a, uh, a nice and uh, safe environment for people to use and therefore it's really important in terms of lighting that they have adequate and proper lighting to, to allow people to move and feel safe in, in that car park. Um, and uh, you know that's one of the reasons why we wanted to make the most of this upgrade to make sure that we have um, really positive uh, customer experience within that car park and, and also being able to reduce our electric bills at the same time. Could I just ask, um, if we get LED lighting, which is a huge investment, of course, um, would that really cut down the 26,000? And are we metered separately to that car park from the energy supplier that the lexicon have? And lastly, do we know who the energy supplier is, as a matter of interest, please? Um, so, uh, yes, it will dramatically reduce uh, 
uh, our consumption. I, I don't have any technical detail on it, but Alex may be able to uh, help me on that. Um, but moving from the existing lights to LED, the costs have been uh, looked at as part of this project. So I don't know if Alex, you wanted to come in on that in terms of the technology. Yeah, yeah the, the high level fi high level figure of a percentage um, reduction of uh, energy is 70% uh, reduction from converting to LED. Wow. That's right, is it? So the 26,000 will be reduced by 70%. Uh, so in terms of energy, uh, yes, that's that's what the high levels that we've we've um, got at the moment, based on initial feasibility. That's extraordinary, actually. To be honest with you, uh, who who is the supplier there, please? So yeah, if, if I could just chair pick yeah, up yeah. Um, on the other questions. Do you want to turn your mic off? Yeah. Um, so the first one was, uh, or the second one Quentin, that you asked was around the, the meter. Yes, we have a separate meter for the Avenue car park. Um, so, uh, but the supplier, yes, we have a, a supplier and I, I know who it is, probably uh, I, I can give you that information offline, Chair. Okay, I'd like it, please. Um, Sandra, uh, let's go to Sandra first, then I'll come back to the, uh, did you want to add to that first? Just a minute, Sandra. Yeah, just at the beginning, you mentioned schools. Schools have access to our blanket supply, which is one of the reasons why our own, remember the, the ocean? The um, Avenue car park is not ours, so it's outside our supply agreement. Um, but the schools are inside the supply agreement, so they are already getting a very advantageous rate. Okay, that's the answer. Thank you very much. Uh, Sandra. Hey, thank you, Chair. Um, you wanted to ask, looking at your list of greening projects, how do you decide which buildings to improve? For instance, uh, why are we improving some libraries, but not all? One community centre, but not all of them? Uh, why, why have you chosen to invest heavily in some buildings rather than improve uh, in a sort of blanket way um, ac across all buildings? Do, do, yeah. do you understand? Uh, yeah. yeah, so, um, so the... the um, the projects we're going to be carried out as part of our plan maintenance program anyway. So where we've uh, got this additional funding, we're able to concentrate it on projects where um, the condition data identified uh, essential repairs that needed to be carried out. And then we can use this funding to carry out greening works to those projects. So as, as an example, where we've got Mallard House, we're doing a roof replacement um, there to a roof that um, is at the end of its life. So as we're doing that, then we're able to add the solar panels to that project. So it stems from the condition data, effectively. Okay, so it's not then because some buildings are using more electricity than others, or that that, that doesn't factor in. It's just where you're improving as a matter of course then. Yes, it is for, it's based on the condition data. data. Okay, all right, thank you. Councillor Hayden, come off me and earn something. Thanks. Um, Thanks, Alex. Just to add to that, the, uh, the property team do a condition survey every year, um, and you'll, you'll see that, uh, it, I've, I know it's a, a document certainly that members see, is that uh, the condition sur survey, survey categorizes into priorities. And then, uh, obviously, the priority ones are attended to first, and it all comes down in terms of how far the budget stretch. But it's driven from a condition survey which does give a, de a degree of priority to the, the state of the building and how and when it's addressed. So it is, it's, it's a very systematic, well-planned routine that's been running for some time. I guess also you have to start somewhere and, and slowly go through the, you know, the, the, the council's uh, uh, buildings. Yes, Mary. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Obviously, I'm going to talk about Great Hollands. Um, <laughs> And um, sorry. <laughs> and I want the thing I, I'm concerned with that is that you said there's cavity wall insulation going in, and there are walls in the children's centre, and there are walls in the library, but walls to take cavity insulation do not exist in the community centre. What we have is windows and pieces of plastic underneath them. So I'm just wondering if instead to help us reduce our heat, 
we could have cav wall insulation sort of put in there like this sort of fibre stuff that's put there to actually stop the heat coming through our little thin plastic because we have no walls in the community centre. Yes, I know the bits that you mean you've got panels below the windows and um, I think as part of our project we are um, insulating those panels so you will get a vast improvement on Thank the heat you. loss. And as we, well as the cavity wall insulation. And we save you on LED because I put that in ages ago when, we, when local councillors had money, we put, I put LED into the uh, lighting in the, throughout the community centre. So we saved on that. So insulation is going to be great. And we did reduce our use of electricity and we do use the council supply of electricity as well. So bargain. Put me in my place there. Uh, Councillor Hayden. I'm sure, and uh, it's perhaps best taken offline, but I'm sure Alex will be able to confirm that your buildings are part of the condition survey and there should be a proper report on it, which hopefully would give you some, some ease of uh, worry. Thank you. Alex, coming back to you in, in a general sense here of climate change in our buildings, um, we're obviously not doing too badly in some ways for a borough, um, I just wonder what your sort of general feeling of, of our property is. And if we had bounds of money, which we don't, but, uh, you know, what would be your attack um, to, 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 to spend the money on? Um, well, I think um, the advice nowadays is, is to go with a fabric first approach. So um, lots of people or lots of organisations tend to jump into um, ground source heat pumps and the mechanical plant. Um, but actually dealing with insulation, uh, cavity wall upgrades, uh, loft insulation can often be the most cost effective way to save the most amount of carbon um, before tackling the high expenditure items such as, um, you know, even solar panels to an extent. So um, I think on that front, Bracknell are, are really far down the road. There's there's not many single, not much single glazed uh, windows left across the school buildings. Um, many of the roofs are, are now compliant with current building regulations. Um, so the fabric is is in a really good condition, I would say. Could I just ask one other question? Um, <clears throat> I think there was a long time ago, maybe someone else can answer this, about our building here we're sitting in, that there was a conversion to, to heat pumps. Am I right? And we couldn't do that because we didn't have the grant to do that. Um, Maybe someone could just take that. I, I can't remember. I remember seeing it on a report that it was quite a lot of money and we didn't get the grant, so we didn't do it. But maybe we could... OK, we'll take it offline. I, I, you know. Chair, so, Chair could I, I, I might be able to help a little bit on that. I'm, I'm not sure it was a heat pump, but we, did work, we were looking at the heating system for the building to see whether we could do... Um, I think it was part of the uh, public sector decarbonisation bids and we didn't, we didn't win that bid. Um, but certainly, um, we've been looking at energy use across the whole of our estate. So one of the things which the executive approved about two years ago now was centralising the estate, so the uh, corporate landlord model. So now all of the properties report into uh, Came Tour, apart from schools. Um, and that's allowed us to have this sort of wider conversation about where do we put our, our efforts and where we take our learning between buildings so we are going to the, the thing that needs the most help first um but we're also then balancing that that conversation with with a little bit more investment can we get more outcome from that building so that will be can we make it more efficient can we reduce its cost in some way um but we as as councillor hayden has said we start from the condition survey and then once we're looking at a building, we look to see what else can go to that. And I think we'll try and do that as part of that programme of investor saves, which is over and above our, our normal uh, corporate uh, repairs and maintenance budget. Yeah, thank you. Um, there was, uh, this is probably not in our remit, but um, I know when I went round the schools, the same applies to fibre optic communication that some schools were and i don't think we were really helping them on that because it's up to the school i think unless i'm wrong here but again because that's becoming such an important part of our daily life is whether we have the same kind of arrangements on fiber optic as we do energy 
I don't know if anyone would want to take that. Yeah, outside our, our remit as, as property, we can ask our colleagues in uh, People Directorate who look after the school's estate. I know Alex's team does the, uh, is, is commissioned to do the plan maintenance work. But as I said, under the corporate landlord model, the schools belong to the schools, either through academisation or um, uh, the uh, Cheryl Air, as the assistant director, looks after those directly. Um, so it's sort of outside of our property portfolio. And, and I'm not sure that we, we do much in terms of uh, client mitigation through in, improving communication, but I think it's important. No, it was just a, general, I'll take it across. just a general question that, you know, if we're doing some savings there, maybe we could pass those on as we have quite a good system coming into the building, don't we, in terms of communication and stuff. But I, 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 it's not my remake, but I just want it recorded that perhaps that's a good idea. Okay, um, would anybody else like to ask the questions of Alex before we let him off the hook? Can I? Mary. Can I just ask what PIR sensors are? I think I know, but just tell me what PIR stands for. Um, in terms of what it stands for, I'm not entirely sure, but it, it, it um, I think Kevin's about the, to jump the in. The leader but knows it, this, actually. Passive, passive uh, infrared. Port, port, oh. I don't know what the R is, but I think it's passive infrared. But they'll, they'll, they effectively turn on when they sense movement in the in their remit. So um, in the car park, if there's no one in there, then they would turn turn off to save energy. Okay, that's fine. Uh, anybody else like to add anything or ask questions of Alex? Alex, you've done a good grilling there. Thank you very much, and um, <laughs> I hope you can come back to to see us again. Thank you very much. Okay, have a nice evening. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> What's left of it? Okay, um, now. We're just moving on, really, um, to round up this committee, I guess, Kevin. Um, in terms of, uh, I mean, it's, uh, just personally speaking, I think climate change is such a fantastic uh, subject to talk about because it actually goes across so many different things. And I know that now this council is really focused on that. And, um, you know, we're getting some really good kind of um, feedback and changes and, and so on. But in terms of the committee, and I know other people would like to speak, and I know you do too, probably, um, it is that, you know, I've asked members what they think the future will hold for us here. And I think members, we've, and I'd like to thank all those the, what, at the beginning here, all the officers and the members who've had um, a lot of work on this, because it, it can be quite a complicated subject, as we know. And once you, it's a bit like um, a Russian doll. Once you pull off the first bit, there's another bit underneath, and so on and so on. So, um, but we, I think we, everyone agrees that we are now focusing hard, and we are achieving some some good things out of it. Now, what the panel is going to do in the future, it, it, it could be left for other people to decide. But I think that we need to kind of put our foot down in in terms of suggesting what we think would be a good area to go in and it gives Kevin and his team time uh, to to get the right people and for us to invite people um, so I, I've just left this rather open as we have time left to members and see what they think I've got my views on this um, and I wondered if I could just start the start the conversation and let other people drift into this um, because I had a fairly big list. I don't want to go through the whole list. Um, but one thing that I thought was really interesting that I sent round was this local energy plan. Um, and I think what's interesting about this, I mean, it's quite a complicated thing. I spoke to Seb about this this afternoon, actually, and I know that he's doing work uh, with the team and with Damien and, and so on about trying to get more data in this and and so on but the late the local uh, energy plan i think that i saw was a kind of idea that brought together well obviously the lep and the local plan because although we can measure carbon it's a national carbon reading it's not a local carbon reading so it doesn't really give us a true reflect about what's happening in bracknell but uh, more data that w could be assessed from our gas electricity requirements, um, what we're using, how the local 
uh, plan will affect us because it will be an increase in the population of Bracknell Forest, uh, new industry coming or, or, or new uh, centres of, 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 um, of work, etc. Um, but I understand, before I pass this to anyone to, to, to have a think about it, I understand that you know, this is quite a lot of work and it means a lot of um, assistance in the council to do, I guess. And maybe we don't have that, those resources. But maybe the thought would be that we try and do this on a wider aspect of Berkshire with different unitaries and see that if we could get a much more accurate plan so that we can see, and this, ca this panel also could measure, um, the carbon reduction over a period of time. Um, to meet that target of 2050. Um, I don't know what people have any thoughts, but I open it to the floor, at least on that, on that idea, to start the conversation going. Would anyone like to have a, have a say? Damien, do you want to say anything at this point? Or what do you think? About the local energy plan yeah. idea. Um, yeah, well, I, I think, um, firstly, it's uh, it's definitely an interesting topic that we should uh, consider. Uh, I think your um, idea about um, looking at it as, as a cross Berkshire plan is um, feels, uh, feels like the right direction to me. Um, we need to, if we're, if we're going to produce a um, local energy plan, we need to work closely with our neighbours. It doesn't stop at the borough boundary. Um, the infrastructure doesn't work by boroughs in, in terms of energy provision. So uh, we definitely need to work with our, with our local uh, authority neighbours. And um, yeah, there are already, there is already a, a cross Berkshire and in fact slightly wider um, climate change group. So that may be the place where um, it, it might fit. Um, I think Councillor Hayes attends that group. Um, there was a meeting uh, a week or so ago, um, and uh, that contains uh, all of the six uh, Berkshire authorities and, uh, say, a slightly wider um, authority group than that. So that, that sounds like probably the place where it might be picked up. But yes, if that is the um, members' wishes for us to look at that, then obviously we, we would consider that as part of uh, any direction we get post-election. Um, good. That's the other side. Of it um, it I comes under Gareth Jones's remit, isn't it, as well, Damien? So it, I, I do think uh, once election, and we know the, the construction of the council as such, it would be the way forward to look at joining up with other councils. It's like working with um, the RE3, the councillors that we do together are food waste, and now I've always wanted to have something to do with anaerobic digester and uh, keeping it where we're not travelling and doing all that. This is where we move forward. Um, yeah, I mean, the point that I suppose I was trying to think, it's quite a, quite a complicated thing to do, I guess, but um, the panel really needs to see some data on this, and it's very difficult to keep anyone to account if we don't really get the data back. I mean, if we're falling behind things, we, we, we obviously don't know that because we haven't got the data. So the matrix of all this is really important. So, um, you know, we, we could, as a panel, and I'm quite happy to, 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 to write to Councillor Hayes and maybe suggest that maybe we could take that forward. And obviously this will be after the, um, the PERDA, but yeah, okay. Good, okay. Um, for me, um, as I don't see any other, um, yeah, let's go to Sandra, actually, and I'll come back to me. Sandra. Okay, uh, just a thought, I'll share it with you. Um, I'm sort of still looking at uh, Kevin's presentation, the scorecard, where we came 360 out of 409 councils. And I just wonder, going forward, uh, whether a, a benchmarking exercise might bear some useful fruit or you know we could learn from councils who are doing really well with their scorecards um i know wiltshire council came fifth and they have converted three of their leisure centers to heat pumps and they've got this sort of innovative recycling poolside of all 
things that people use in the pools, like goggles and flippers and armbands and that kind of thing. Um, I just think there are lessons we could learn and, you know, ideas that we could borrow from councils that have been successful so far. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if anyone would like to suggest an answer. Kevin, shall I come to you for, for some thoughts here? Yes, Chair. So, just I'm picking up um, uh, the, the last point and uh, Councillor Ingham's point, I, I think the first one when you said uh, we have no data, um, I think, Chair, we, we do have data. Uh, we don't have data to absolute granularity, but the measure that we chose to look at was the what was the um, Department of Energy and Industrial Strategy, which has now changed its name, so I had no idea what that was. But we use that data on an annual basis to see that we're going in the right direction. And we've certainly seen that there's only one or two authorities across the country which are outperforming us and have outperformed us over the period of time. But I think it would be worth getting more granular data because it's really about then saying, where do we put our efforts? So we've got data which we get from government. We've got the EPC data around properties. We've got our own measures against our own buildings. Um, what uh, Seb Wright's doing is obviously trying to build that into a model so that we can actually say where we can see our efforts will make some, some um, uh, benefits. But picking up the issue with the scorecard, I think, Chair, the point I made earlier is we don't recognise the data which is in that scorecard. Um, we weren't asked. Um, we can't see the FOIs that they've used to pull that data together. So on one sense, I think we've spent the last, what, 18 months or so questioning where that data came from and why we weren't asked, because we were asked, we would have been able to give some of that information. Um, what we've done this time is take that um, that lesson to heart, that actually, um, rather than wait to be asked, to actually put our own efforts together, look at that scorecard, and make sure that we've got that data on our website, so that we're able to match back and to say, actually, we think that's unfair. And only once we've got accurate data can we then have that conversation with other authorities. So we went to Oxford because of their charging hub to see is that something that we can do? And obviously we're bringing that forward. Um, I'd want to see us um, benchmarking and seeing what, what, who's doing the best stuff, but we also need to make sure that it's the best stuff for Bracknell Forest rather than just gets us sort of topping show. So yes, I think data can be really important. It's gonna be the, the um, how, how we disaggregate that data and how do we see which communities are being benefited from our investments, which ones aren't, so that we don't find ourselves accused of uh, climate change for one group and, uh, and not for another. We want to make sure that every part of the community is able to participate. Like our food waste, we've made sure that we've got out to as many people with that with, as a solution, uh, rather than just did it for, as in some authorities, for some very limited groups of people who they've seen as being more worthy than others. Oh, sorry. Uh, could I just take up your, the first point you mentioned, Kevin? Um, the data in our local plan is out, it is quite some time ago, first of all. That's the first point I would make. The second point is that um, the carbon is not a true reflection of, of, of this area the, the, because it's a unified, it's, it's across the country. Um, so a lot that comes from uh, central government is, is a UK-wide reading. Um, what I think the local plan, the local energy plan would give us is a more accurate picture of this area. Now, I'm not suggesting that we could do it on our own because I think it's quite a big thing to do. But if we manage to do it with other authorities um, and we would know the, the amount, and I, I asked this this morning um, uh, of various people, we'd know the amount of gas, for instance, that Bracknell is consuming. Um, we'd know the amount of electricity. Now, if that was the case and it was joined to our local plan, um, we could then, I remember we had Southern and Scottish Energy that came to talk to us some months ago. And, you know, one of their problems is upgrading the network. Because if we all go to electricity, um, frankly, our network will blow because we just don't have enough power. Um, so that they had a plan, I can remember it, uh, of upgrading certain areas. 
Um, and what they said, and I can remember the guy saying it, if, if he knew where all the development was going, it would help them better plan um, the upgrades. Now, a local energy plan would help us do that because we would see from the local plan the, the population growth uh, and employment prospects, et cetera, et cetera, and we could give an accurate picture of where that would therefore be um, useful to Southern Scottish. So what I'm trying to say is that rather than just Bracknell, it, it really affects, um, say, Thames Water. It affects Southern Scottish energy for our area and all those things. And we could be a leader in that um, to give information, a conduit, if you like. So, Chair, I, I don't recognise that I've ever presented to the panel local plan data. Um, I'm not sure if you're confusing the local plan with the climate change action plan no 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 uh, what the, i'm the, what the, i said well, no the, let me just finish please what I, what i said is and i sent round is that this is an idea of taking us on to a more accurate picture of carbon reduction emissions con uh, of reduction not just for Bracknell forest council but across the whole area and it would so be Go ahead. So, Chair, if, I, if, I, if I'm able to just uh, very quickly from the annual reports just uh, present for, for members. So, this is, uh, this is our, 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 the, the data which is in our annual report. So, this is a borough wide. But this um, is a general, the, 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 hold on, this is a general borough, this is a general carbon emission. This this isn't the carbon just for Bracknell Forest, is it? I think we learned yes, that. Yes, it is. Well, that's not what Seb told us last time, actually. So, so, so what, we, what we've got from central government is we get the breakdown for the borough area, which um, government, so Bez provides that figure on a borough footprint area, looking at all of the area emissions, um, and that's been in our that's in our, our, our base strategy and in the annual report, and it shows the progression of what carbon comes down. I would agree with you that to get beneath this and the fact that it is sort of uh, 12, 14 months behind where we'd want it to see, they'll actually get in a more granular level of data. Um, would be helpful. But I think it would be wrong to say that we do not have any data. And as I said, to then say um, the local plan, this is nothing to do with the local plan. So I make sure you get this data from um, government, which is at borough level. And within our report also, we, we drill down in terms of the Bracknell Forest Council admissions as well. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm I'm just saying that we do have data. Um, we do make sure this panel is, has, has the data no, no, we've I, got. I, I'm not disagreeing with you on, on some of the points you make. Where, where I'm trying to make the point here, Kevin, is that if you just take energy, which we're talking about, the supply of electricity, we all know that if tomorrow we went out and bought an electric car, the whole of us here, everybody in Bracknell Forest, the energy supply would not cope with it. It cannot possibly cope with it. It would blow. Now, okay, that's fine because we can't control what people buy. I understand that. But I think what the local energy plan would give us is a more accurate picture, and it is linked to the local plan because the local plan is the population growth, as we all know, that is, uh, is something that we're all working to. So that growth will need supplying electricity, and I would suggest that all of the houses that we now build will be electricity powered. So it will have a huge effect on the amount of energy in our local grid. Chair, I don't disagree with anything you've just said, apart from you, you started by saying that you had no data and the data in the local plan said one thing. And obviously what this, um, my advice or support to this panel is based on what the CO2 emissions are and how we're driving those down. Um, we can see that information provided by a sector by sector basis on a borough footprint. We have much more de data for our own emissions. Um, and that's why within our strategy, we both look at the things that we have direct control over, which is what Alex's presentation was, but also um, the work we've been doing with other businesses is to say, how do we move this green chart and continue that sort of that, that point of drifting down in terms of the CO2 kilotons in the borough? 
and as I said, we put that annually in the in the the, the report so that members have got access to that. But as yep. I said, I, I completely agree with you that having the next level down would be useful. I think it needs to, uh, yeah, I, I think we just need to deep dive actually, uh, and that would be more accurate. I, I mean, I don't want to prolong this discussion really, but I think, you know, if you have a look at what um, the local energy plan suggestion um, that, that I sent round, I think it seems like a really good idea. But it does cause for a lot more data, and that data we can then assess. Um, but you know, it, it, it's a suggestion. I know Councillor Hayes will take it up, so um, that's fine. Um, just moving on, um, I, I also think we should just look at Thames Water. That's my feeling, because I'm absolutely disgusted at the amount of sewage that's going into our rivers, and actually Bracknell sewage plant was one of the um, plants that actually um, offended by putting a lot of sewage in the rivers. Um, and I think although you could say, you know, Tony, what's climate change got to do with water? But I think it's got a hell of a lot to do with water, to be honest. Um, and so um, I know the council really aren't in charge of this, but I really think as a body, um, we should start to say that this is just unacceptable to the residents of Bracknell Forest and we should do something about it. Um, I know locally in Winkfield Row, um, the sewage discharge into the cut. The cut has lost a lot of its wildlife. This continues to go on. We build more houses. There is no plan, actually, to be honest. It's a sticky plast system from Thames Water. And I'd just like us to deep dive. I'd like us to go and see Thames Waters plant at Bracknell uh, with, with members, if they're keen to do this, and just to open up this whole thing to the public. Um, just before I leave this, because I know people are excited by this and they put their hand up, um, but there's a wonderful documentary on BBC, currently running on BBC Four on a Sunday, uh, and it's all about the Lake District, and it's a disgrace. And it, 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 it's saying that the you know, United uh, Utilities here are, are just allowing foul water to go into the lakes. Appalling. Councillor Hayes. I'm not going to disagree with anything you said, but there is a climate change element to this, isn't it? Because the discharge of sewer is very closely linked to uh, stormwater, uh, which is yeah. getting worse. And to cope with the stormwater that's appearing now, is hugely, hugely expensive. Uh, we, we, it, it's, it's a Solomon type situation, isn't it? And we're all the same. We all dislike the idea of uh, sewage being discharged, but nature sometimes seems to take over. And that's, that's not an excuse, but it is really a problem. And people acknowledge the problem, but I think there's an awful lot of head scratching in terms of how we can afford to you know, approach it. I, I do, and um, I think it would also be interesting for all the members to look at their own area and, and see the hot spots that they endure, because when you really deep dive into this, it's quite appalling what's gone on. Um, and we have a very Victorian system, and, and frankly, I know it's a lot of money to upgrade it, but we're just making it worse by the day, day after day. Um, Chris Turrell, um, please. Uh, thanks, Tony. Um, I would suggest if you um, want to look at what utility providers are doing, um, they do all have plans for providing for demand, and it might be worth inviting one to present to this forum. Um, I think you could then also ask them about the sewage question in their particular area. Um, I, I do think the overall problem with, with sewage is it relates to uh, national legislation and um, I think that probably needs to be uh, something where you know we could look into it but I, I think the real um, way to get change is probably through national in, in, in nat national legislation local plans are are part of uh, are part of that there's a requirement on the council to produce a local plan. Um, I think in terms of catering for, for energy needs, um, I think the approach that's been set out in the, in the presentation is helpful in terms of what the council can do. Um, and that is part of what what is done um, locally. In, in terms of doing anything, um, any other documents about it, I think it's probably better to look and see what the statutory framework is because um, 
uh, for these pieces of work to have authority, um, it's it is best if they come, um, you know, on the, um, as a result of statutory requirement. And it may be that uh, there needs to be statutory change um, in order to um, to alter the focus of it. But I think it would be helpful to understand the current um, uh, what the current framework is and what the current requirements are to produce so uh, um, to produce this information. Um, that way, I think we're starting on much sure of foundations in in actually a getting the information and b um, having a chance of of getting anything um, you know having get anything significant done. Um, those would be my observations. Um, Thanks, Chris. Okay. I, I think the, the the real problem. You know this uh, better than than anyone actually, is that Thames Water have a duty to um, to connect. Um, and as far as I understand the regulations, they can't refuse to do that. Um, and we can't really refuse on, on a planning issue um, on the grounds of a lack of sewage disposal. Uh, so yeah, you're so, absolutely right. Um, yeah. And to cater for that, they do they do have plans about infrastructure provision, um, but, and most notably when large developments go in. But of course, they do also have to service their infrastructure. And that's why I think it would be a useful um, source of information to um, get them to present and ask those and ask those specific questions. Mm, I think that's a great idea. Uh, and we'll, can we, Kevin, put that down and we could ask someone from Thames Water. I mean, what would be presumably a good idea is to have a little visit um, of the members first to have a look at some of the problems which they face, um, see their side of the story, um, get a presentation and then ask questions. So I think that would be a very good session if everyone agrees. Uh, yeah, Peter. Um, it's interesting what Chris said, that you know, some of the answers to this is at a national level. It made me think back to your, uh, uh, Alex's chart, and t was it Alex's or your chart on um, uh, carbon output across the roads? But that was the, that was the biggest contributor. But notice that the one road that was missing was the M4. Uh, which again is, is a national responsibility, and um, I would I'd, I wouldn't even like to guess where that would be on that on that chart. Mm -hmm. And it's a similar thing with water. With you know, um, we are part of a national infrastructure, and we, we can't be responsible for you know. It's we we have I, I, all I the will I in the world. <coughs> I see your point, but with I, other bodies. I think you know we represent the residents, yeah, um, yeah. and and if. You know, if there's a real problem with the uh, with the area that we represent, we have every right to call people to account. No, I'm not pushing you. Okay. <laughs>
uh, wrapped in plastic and Spain and Portugal are joining in the share. Yeah. If anybody's interested, I'm happy to send this across. I signed a petition when I got it the other day. I think <laughs> Peter's saying things to me. Sorry. Um, I think we're all keen to do that. I think the whole panel would sign that, uh, Ray. Um, one thing I just don't understand, actually, uh, we were the last country, I think, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the UK to have the ban plastic bags, because I just find that astonishing, frankly. Uh, the second thing is, although we have plastic bags banned, um, we're still issuing loads of plastic bags still because they're very cheap to buy. It, it just seems a nonsensical policy. Um, and we should have done, uh, we should have got away with plastic a long time ago, but we haven't. Um, so, you know, I, I really think that's something that we should look at and help and try and encourage um, the local uh, uh, supermarkets to, um, to unwrap uh, products. Because if you go to France, you're quite right, they do not wrap stuff. It's there for people to take because you're going to wash the food anyway. So it just seems nonsense to me. But anyway, I, I think it's a very good point to say. Um, also, I think... Oh, sorry, Damien. Uh, thank you, Jen. No, I just, if, can I pick up, go back to the um, uh, littering, please, actually? So I just wanted to um, bring attention to our uh, fantastic contractors, uh, Continental Landscape, who spend uh, a considerable amount of time uh, litter picking in the borough uh, and also to draw the chair's attention to um, the Great British um, Spring Clean which is coming up and uh, there's plenty of information on the website uh, if people want to get involved but we're encouraging uh, residents and uh, local businesses to get involved uh, and in fact uh, parts of the council team themselves will be out litter picking as well as part of that uh, Great British Spring Clean so um, an opportunity coming up for members and the public to get involved in uh, keeping the, the borough litter free. Mary, thank you, Dom. But <coughs> litter picks are great. I organise one every four times, five times a year. But the thing, the sadness is that as soon as you stop picking the litter, you go away, and an hour later, it's so it, we've got to stop the litter being there. And our roads um, entry to Bracknell are atrocious, actually, on the A two two and the Crowsbourne Road. It's all down the sides, and it looks horrible. We're not as bad as near um, other places. I agree with that. I mean, some some of the roads you go, it's awful. But it's somehow this plastic stopping, getting super, um, getting takeaway food to not give plastic and not do that would would help a lot of stuff because around Bracknell you can see they buy it from one of the shops they go away and then when they've finished out it goes in the car and there it is you can see you know where to pick it up because that's how far the car got before they finished eating it and so a big thing with all our supermarkets and with all the fast food is to actually stop this thing and i mean many <coughs> when when people ask if they could have another um, mobile van in an area the one thing you always think of no way because of the litter <laughs> so yeah it's a big issue it's re-educating it's going back to them paul thank you chairman thank you yeah uh, litter is a uh, particularly uh, uh, it's a subject particularly close to my own heart having been for six years a trustee of keep britain tidy um, and during that time, um, I did uh, virtually single-handedly fight for the government to allow littering from cars to be treated in the same way as speeding, as parking, and as going into the London, uh, 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 Lon London congestion zone uh, without paying. In other words, um, the, the law had, believe it or not, um, been that if you wanted to prosecute somebody for throwing a pizza box out of a car, and I've seen that happen in some of the places that Mary has said is, is bad for litter, um, you would have to identify beyond all reasonable doubt who in the car actually lobbed it out? Well, that's clearly 
never going to happen, as a result of which, to the best of our knowledge at the time, and Keep Britain Tidy did investigate it thoroughly, nobody had ever been prosecuted in this country for littering from a car. So we, we kept on and eventually won, and the government did make it, so that now you can do exactly as they do with those other sins that car drivers uh, uh, seem to uh, love doing on a regular basis. And all you have to do is spot the car and get the registration number. And then the driver or the registered keeper gets the fixed penalty fine and then it's up to the driver, and this happens with all the others, if he claims, he or she claims she was not the driver at the time of the incident, to dob in the person who yeah. did. Because you'll recall if you go through a speed camera and you say, well, I wasn't driving, that's not enough. You then have to go and sign an affidavit who was driving because that person then gets prosecuted. Yeah. So, so I think we might, well, there, there, there might be something that we could do as this mm. council mm. to remind the public that, that it, if they see somebody littering, and, and it is now an antisocial behaviour, if they, if they would give the registration number to the council, then let us say that we'll pursue it on their behalf. Now, that would worry me if I normally sat in traffic munching on a pizza and then just lobbed the bloody box out of the window. Look, I, I, look that's great. Um, Paul, that's a great well, idea. Well, I think I should Let, do yeah, that. Well, and and, I th and just, to take, just to take it further, um, I mean, we could also liaise this with all the parish councils so Absolutely. that everybody, and the councillors as well, yeah. are, you know, looking at this, and if they see a car... Report it, and we we'll could, do something about it. We could make a topic. It, it, uh, I think Cancer it's September. Haste. Is the education uh, the um, education <laughs> conference again of the schools? Yeah, and that's where it's getting it out there. It's yeah. it's, it's re-educating people that it, it it's not acceptable. Yeah. But to but be but to, uh, yeah. there's Sorry, another thing, Chairman, is is that nationally, um, the last figure I have was that councils in this country spend 980 million pounds a year picking up litter from the roadside. But actually, that's only the tip of the iceberg. As I pointed out to my then fr very good friends at, uh, at Keep Britain Tidy, and Damien know, will know this, if you're going to litter pick that difficult bit of road where there is... Gone is the day when you can say to the dear fellow from the council, well, you're going to work by the side of 70 mile an hour traffic. You now have to close the road. And that means, because nobody owns enough, enough bollards to do it themselves, you have to go to a company that makes its money because they own millions of bollards and the trucks to put them out. And, and by my reckoning... The 980 million is about 20% of the real cost of picking up that litter because councils tend to only put the time of the, of the employee that picks it up. They're not counting the cost of closing the highways. And, of course, they haven't even started to estimate the cost to local businesses of the... Di of the of, of the chaos that ensues when you close carriageways for, you know, for a day. So, so it's a real issue, a real issue. I, I, you know, thank you, Paul, very much, um, because I think that's something we can give a lot of publicity to, and I think it means... To, I mean, uh, education is one thing, but, you know, hey, this is a real problem in the whole country. I'm disgusted by it, actually. I drove from... I drove up the other day to, to Manchester... And frankly, it was only 
when I got, I think, in North Oxfordshire somewhere, coming into Warwickshire, that there wasn't litter everywhere on the motorway. It, it's, it's awful. And, and, you know, you can't expect the councils to pick this bill because it's, 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 a, it's a problem we've all faced. So the tougher we are with people that decide to lob things out the window, I'm all for, frankly. Um, did somebody else want to speak? David, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair, um, and uh, thank you, Councillor Bedson. Just in terms of Bratton Forest and us uh, closing roads, we work extremely closely with our colleagues in highways, so when we have to close roads, we um, undertake other maintenance tasks at the same time. So uh, we work in partnership with highways, so they might be doing some gully emptying or they might be replacing some curbstones, uh, and as a result of that work, they would close the road. We then follow up behind them uh, to make sure we do litter picking at the same time. But it is a, a very costly exercise to, to close roads uh, and inconvenient for everyone else. We'll, we'll try and do something about that and publicise it. And um, we'll follow that up with, uh, with, with, with people and our own pu publicity. The last two things before we close the meeting. One is um, I, I look forward to more people coming on this panel um, with expertism because I think, you know, just people who can tell us the truth of the matter sometimes is something that we um, we, we need uh, to make any kind of um, suggestions to the um, to, to the executives um, and one last thing um, is communication I just think we need clear messages and not all try and do the same thing but try and just give a very clear message of what we're trying to do if it's litter then we'll have one phrase that we are going to go out and everybody uses the same phrase and that's it so because i think that's the way of getting things done so if anyone else would like to say anything and i don't see any hands up i'm going to close this meeting um i'd just like to say thank you to everyone that's contributed i'd like to thank the officers um i'd like to thank all the people that have joined us from outside and i'd like to thank the residents if, if they are looking in at the moment and say thank you very much um, that's the end of this committee for this uh, period of um, local authority time. We go into elections very soon, uh, so we have to say goodbye because we're not allowed to say anything. <laughs> There's a gag around us.